So, um, welcome tonight. Again, I'm sorry it's um, a bit wet out there, but thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, this is the very last of our um, seminar series, which has run over two terms on population and science. Um, Populism and Science, um, and it is uh, jointly sponsored by the Oxford Institute of Population Aging, the Oxford Martin School, uh, and University College, who joined us this term uh, as one of the sponsors of the series. And we have had, um, this is our 13th speaker, uh, and for those of you who have either followed us on YouTube or who have uh, come uh, each week, um, you will be aware that we've taken Populism and Science and we have run uh, through many different aspects, all the way from policy makers, we've had speakers from Go Science, the Cabinet Office, uh, the Chief Scientific Advisor spoke to us last week. Uh, we have had um, a variety of science journalists. Um, we were delighted to have Fiona Fox from the Science Media Center and uh, Clive Cookson, the science editor of the Financial Times. And we've also had people who work directly in science communication from the British Science Association, from the New Scientist, and from a variety uh, of museums and other organizations. Uh, and it's been a wonderful journey um, in a time that has actually changed very quickly. Um, and those of you will remember last week that I um, talked a little bit about things that had happened since May when we um, started uh, this series. And indeed, many of you uh, may well have heard two things since just last week. Um, one of our shadow um, ministers announcing on television on Sunday morning that the age of the expert is now dead. Are we in the age of Google? I'm not sure. Um, and a very interesting uh, analysis in one of the Sunday papers comparing left-wing populism, which they argue very much tends to tackle big business, uh, government, uh, and right-wing populism that tends to go for what they call the elite culture, scientists, theater, arts, etc. cetera. Um, and that puts us uh, very much as um, academics and researchers uh, in the target, uh, so to speak. Um, this series has celebrated 20 years of research on population aging at the University of Oxford. And when we started this, I think some people asked, what have we got to do uh, with populism and science? But we've always very firmly believed, um, from when we set it up in 1998, uh, that the best kind uh, of research um, informs and is informed by policy and practice. Uh, and the second driver to this uh, series was as I've said before, when I directed the Royal Institution last year, and I was introduced to this world of science communication. So it's very much been a journey uh, that has evolved through the Institute, but also in the series uh, itself. But we also uh, have to um, be very grateful that we have very firm institutions out there that are very aware uh, of these changing frames that we uh, work in. Um, obviously, the Government Office of Science, if you like, looks after our policymakers, but UKRI is our very big funding body and to a certain extent uh, is going to be the framework within which many of us not only do our research, but also disseminate and communicate our research. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted that our last speaker uh, is the um, new uh, CEO, CEO, Chief Executive, Executive Chair, the new Executive Chair, uh, of the um, ESRC, and she's going to come and talk to us tonight um, about people in the frontiers of science. Um, before uh, Jennifer Rubin became the executive chair, um, she uh, worked uh, at RAND um, in both um, in the, the European um, offices, and she ended up as one of their vice presidents. Um, she also is currently a professor of public policy at King's College, and she has a fantastic background. She is the UK representative on NATO's task force on ethnic intolerance in the military, uh, and is the executive lead for equality, diversity, and inclusion uh, for uh, UKRI. So very much not only at the forefront of cutting edge research, but also at policy and practice, and that bigger frame within which uh, we work. Um, she has a first, a first class degree in European politics from Loughborough and did her PhD at the University of Cambridge. And thank you so much in your very busy schedule of coming and talking to us tonight. And before I ask her to come up, Jennifer is very, very keen that the younger researchers in the audience, the postdocs, the graduates, the emerging researchers, should be able to engage in some kind of a conversation. So she's going to keep her talk quite short. And then, as we said um, on the web, and hopefully um, those of you who have come because of this, 
um, that we hope to have some kind of a discussion and debate about some of the issues, particularly from our, our younger uh, members. So, Jennifer, thank you very much. Sarah and thank you all for being here tonight um, and congratulations on the 20th birthday of the Oxford Inter Institute for Population Aging. Um, it's a tremendous accomplishment uh, in policy relevant re research that we should all be thinking about um, amongst many of the others who, who are here tonight working in brilliant institutes around uh, the city. Um, thank you also all. I, I know that, that many of you come out on a dark, cold, rainy night, and it's the end of term, so uh, I'll try to keep this relatively brief um, and really then open up. I think it would be wrong in the, uh, with so many from the Institute of Population Aging to, to only allow the, the, young, uh, the young academics and researchers to speak, so I hope we will hear from everybody, but absolutely, um, you know, many of you are the, the researchers and policy makers of the future, so I'm, I'm very keen to hear um, uh, your thoughts about the role of social science um, in, in these times. So as Sarah said, and thank you for the kind introduction, I'm the executive chair of the ESRC, and I'm also the executive chair lead on equality, diversity, and inclusion for um, UK research and innovation, which is the 7,000 staff that make up uh, the funding and institutes of UKRI, um, but also aiming to improve outcomes for the whole research and innovation landscape. Uh, so that's a, a small additional job uh, to, to funding social science in this country. Um, as ESRC, we're working on our strategy for the coming years, so this makes it especially timely, um, 10 months into my new role, uh, to be able to come out and, and hear some of uh, what, you, well, say a bit about what I'm thinking right now, but then more importantly really to hear uh, from, from all of you as well. Um, and, and I'm interested to hear about some of the challenges of doing uh, social science and research in this landscape, but also I hope some of the successes, new initiatives, and, and, and what uh, funders can be doing to support those. Um, so as, as Sarah also said, I'm a professor of public policy at King's, where I used to uh, run the Policy Institute there before taking up this role. And I guess a, a question that somebody asked me before the lecture and, and several others have asked since, um, how, how did I end up doing all of this? So uh, if it's okay, if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'll say a little bit about my trajectory because it's not a, a, a completely typical one. Um, and, and then I will move on to, to set the scene for, for um, some of the discussion. So um, decades ago, when I was a, a young doctoral student in social and political sciences, uh, I was really interested in and excited by the potential of research to actually help better understand the great challenges of our time, whether they're you know, across the social sciences, whether those were inequalities, violence in society, how we run work in organizations. Um, but I was also struck by how little really systematic connection there was between the excellent research that I was learning about and finding in, in, the, in the research environment around me at Cambridge at the time and beyond, uh, and the related policies and practices, that uh, the policies that were being made by so many uh, in government, clinicians, um, practitioners, teachers, uh, who really were in a position to influence uh, many people's lives and, and their outcomes. Uh, and I, I couldn't quite see why there was such a disconnect, and it seemed to me um, that actually, uh, in my own research as well, it was becoming increasingly apparent that changes to equality policy in the 1970s weren't actually going to achieve all the longed for or hoped for transformations and outcomes if they didn't simultaneously get to grips with understanding the cultures, the psychologies, the behaviors, the constraints that were creating and sustaining inequalities in the first place. So uh, I became increasingly interested in this nexus of policy, practice, and research and, and how we might uh, bring those closer together. So I took up um, some lectureships and, and became an academic after my PhD, well, during and after, but with a growing interest in finding ways to actually close this gap between the research uh, and the policy that uh, it seemed like it could so, so importantly benefit from it. So this led me to help grow and lead uh, research um, both inside and outside of, of academia um, in an independent policy-focused research organization, as Sarah said, at RAND for several years before returning to academia as a professor of public policy. 
Now, the choice to return to academia was in part as uh, changes to the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, um, and changes to policymakers and the wider public's expectations of what research would deliver for the public good were very much coming to the fore. And it meant that many universities, well, several certainly, um, were starting to set up policy institutes and other kinds of kind of more translational facilities to increase the interaction between what I saw as the brilliant research base that we have in this country and the challenges and decisions faced daily by those in charge of making them. So in my view, and I think a theme in, hopefully in the discussion today, is that questions about this relationship between research and decisions that affect people's lives, between science and the public, as I know you've been discussing throughout this excellent series, and perhaps especially in some ways between social science and public policy, uh, are actually not new. They've been live questions uh, for a very long time. Um, but with many changes in the landscape, both changes to, in the societal landscape and changes in the research landscape, um, and significant technological, scientific, and biomedical advances, it seems to me that they're at least as important now, um, and perhaps more so. So, I will um, briefly talk a little bit about the changing social context, but there are many of you here who are experts in many of the areas that one could say a lot about, so I'll just very briefly talk about that, um, a bit about the changing, maybe a bit more about the changing research landscape um, in a kind of a, an organizational structural sense, um, and then a bit about what the questions I think that raises or, or thoughts about social science um, for this, this changing landscape. And that's where I, I'd really, I will provide some examples, but then I'd also really like to open up for um, some further discussion. And I'd also like to say none of this in is intended to be comprehensive. I'm going to do a, a pretty rapid trot through uh, m much of it, a little bit of the history um, and then present day, and, uh, and, and then move into some examples and the discussion. So to name uh, just a few of the relevant, the many, many relevant changes that we could talk about, um, none of you needs much, uh, much persuading that uh, there's some pretty massive demographic changes that are going on and that uh, will affect everything from uh, how, how we continue to live well in older age, how we function as communities, um, the roles of uh, different institutions and groups in achieving a healthy, fair, and prosperous society. So very rich terrain there. Um, we face uh, very uh, significant environmental challenges globally um, in tackling climate change, and these will have implications for health, energy, food, migration, infrastructure, and beyond. And of course, um, new technologies. Technologies obviously helping us address some challenges uh, and improve how we do some things, but um, it also clearly creates uh, some new challenges of its own. Um, so with all of that, we also at the same time have, have quite a different economy than we had, um, certainly when ESRC was set up, um, but over the last uh, 60 or 70 years. So you can see here, um, 1950, the spread of the economy, just um, very starkly, uh, very significantly, um, a strong manufacturing base at that time. And then here's where we are today, um, where with a much more dominant services economy, services-based economy. And um, that really has implications for, in my view, pretty much every aspect of our lives. I mean, the, the, the way that, that um, housing and cities were set up, the way that uh, people were trained and, and what, uh, expected to work, um, all of these things were, you know, for, and even the research funding, the R&D that we needed, um, were, were really uh, evolved at a time when, when uh, manufacturing production were, were uh, much more dominant than they are now. And services, of course, depend very heavily on how people live and interact with each other, how they interact with their public and private services, how they make decisions, um, what they're looking for from these interactions and what they gain from them. So um, just to give a slightly different picture of, of uh, what that looks like, um, this is the proportion of people, people employed in these different areas. Um, just a, a quick snapshot of that, and you can see uh, a very significant growth or expansion of people employed in the services sector. And as I said, that has, in my view, really important implications for what people do, how they work, and indeed what, what research and development we might need in order to uh, do better at that in the future. Now, 
As you may be aware, um, the research councils have their origins in the aftermath of the First World War, when Lord Haldane set out formal proposals for ensuring that independent, opportunity-led research continued separately from that research that was undertaken in and for government to inform decision-making. So there's the Haldane report. Um, moving forward then to the 1940s, um, the country was again emerging from war, and there was widespread recognition of the successful role that science had played in war efforts. Uh, and that was really, really um, a, a matter of, of, some, of great respect and admiration. Government was concerned to ensure ongoing support um, for the three councils that already existed by this time in medicine, agriculture, um, scientific and industrial research. And there was also um, growing recognition of the value of the statistical and economic functions that were set up during the war to ensure data for policy making and decision making and tracking trends. So it was this interest, actually, which led to a committee being appointed to consider whether it would be useful to add a, a fourth council, and uh, one that would specifically look into economic and social questions. And this was the Clapham Committee. Um, John Clapham was a leading economist of the time, and it published its findings in 1946. It concluded that this wasn't actually the right time to set up a social science council. Um, and it, I quote, at the time they decided it was best to avoid diverting the best men from doing research to coordinating research. Um, and they were talking about men. I, I'm quite happy personally to be diverted from, from, from the research to, to helping coordinate and fund it. Um, but, but that was something that was a concern at the time. Um, and also to avoid, and this one's interesting, a danger of a premature crystallization of spurious orthodoxies. So that's, um, that, that was how they were thinking at the time, and, and okay. Um, but instead, they did set up a, a, a standing interdepartmental economic and social research committee that was going to then survey and advise on the research that, that was going on in government departments, or that could be going on in government departments. Well, over that period, um, discussions continued and actually political support grew, accompanied by an expansion of social science research through that period and teaching in universities. And there was a desire also to start to expand uh, universities and the subjects that would be covered and who would cover them. And so the Hayworth Committee was set up uh, in 1963 to review research in the field of social studies uh, and advise if changes were needed from, from that which had been established already. So the resulting report published in 1965 was actually a turning point for the social sciences. It, it said that actually this is a set of disciplines and it made a strong case for establishing a research council which the Secretary of State for Education at the time, um, Sir Anthony Crossland, persuaded the government then to do. And he appointed uh, Michael Young as the first chair. And as was announced in the Times at the time, the social sciences had arrived, hooray. Um, so that was all very exciting, and in 1965, the Social Science Research Council uh, was set up under the Science and Technology Act. And the article does say that social research, and again I quote, still had some fairly bizarre ventures sailing under its flag. I, I kind of hope we still do, but anyway. Um, it acknowledged that there was now much wider recognition of what social research can or would do to limit the uncertainties in the midst of which policies must be prepared and decisions taken and evaluated. So actually this ability to help inform policy and decision making was just at the very heart of the decision to set up a social science research council at all. Um, but the debate around the role of social science, you won't be surprised to hear, didn't end with the formation of what was then the Social Science Research Council and discussions around disciplinary scope, the application of research methods and so on continued. Some suggested that social science deals with questions of common sense or political judgment, neither of which were seen as, as great areas for researchers to stray into. Um, and there was also a perception that social sciences were considered as questioning and oppositional by those who had already chosen to pursue a particular policy direction. Um, I think some of us would, would wear that badge quite, quite proudly, actually, um, when, you know, if it, it's about informing policy with evidence and research. Now, some of these pressures led to another review, um, which happened in the early 1980s and was a committee chaired by Lord Rothschild at the time. 
And this committee questioned the very status of the Social Science Research Council as a research council and explored whether some parts of its work should be transferred to some other institutions instead. Um, actually, many expected the worst from this. I think it, it was widely expected, or at least by, by many, that, that this could be the end of a social science research council. But actually, through quite rigorous investigations, talking to many people, seeing how the social sciences had expanded during the period, um, it, it actually came to the decision uh, that there should be a stronger focus on empirical research in areas of public concern, so relevant to your, your series here, but it absolutely did not conclude that there was no longer a case for a research council. So uh, the Social Science Research Council was then relaunched in 1983 as the Economic and Social Research Council, which is what we are today. And uh, in the century since um, the establishment of the research councils overall, there's certainly been ongoing discussion and debate about the role of uh, the ESRC and other councils and the funding of research um, and its role in society. Now, it's absolutely right in the shifting landscape of you know, changing technology, changing demography, changing economic uh, focus, um, that we should continue to discuss this and debate this and figure out what's the, what do we actually need to be doing. Um, most recently, of course, the Nurse Review, so Paul Nurse was, was asked to consider these questions and to say, do we have the right funding landscape for the questions and issues and challenges of our times now? So the review was carried out in 2014, or had its origins in the government's 2014 science and innovation strategy, and uh, actually that came to a series of um, findings of its own. Um, the, so Paul Nurse and the Nurse Review, which spoke widely to people across um, the academic and policy uh, communities and thought about research and innovation landscapes, concluded that a research endeavor has to be permeable and fluid so that there could be a transfer of ideas, skills, and people across sectors and disciplines. Um, it also concluded that there must be a research based on the knowledge of the relevant phenomena of the time, uh, and also a recognition of the kind of, the, well, the public really, the societal and policy and customer needs, as they called it. So the recommendation was uh, to establish mechanisms to deal with cross-cutting issues such as the support of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research, grand challenges, and the redistribu redistribution of resource between research councils in response to new developments, advances, and priorities in the research endeavor. So really kind of flexibility to engage across sectors, across disciplines, as needed um, by the demands of the time. And uh, it was these recommendations, of course, which led to the establishment of UK Research and Innovation um, earlier this very year, in April. Now, here's a, a very quick overview, which I will not dwell on um, right now, of uh, the establishment of UK Research and Innovation, the aim to really uh, push the frontiers of knowledge and understanding, and in doing so, to deliver economic impact, social and cultural impact, so to really address those, those uh, requests of engaging with what the public needs, what policy and decision makers need um, in these, this world of complex challenges. Here are some of the many um, hundreds of millions of pounds of, of funding streams that are, uh, have been set up, um, some of them just predating, but, but many of them uh, with the, with the um, establishment of UK research and innovation. Many of them will be familiar to you, some of them are, are newer and uh, you'll probably become familiar with. Um, but what I want to say a little bit about now is the changing sort of ecosystem in which this uh, changing landscape has, has evolved, if you like, or has been established, and which it will further help to evolve and, and embed. Um, so we have a range of societal challenges. Uh, we have a kind of a push, if you like, from, from the research community. Some researchers very keen to address societal challenges and to think about how their research can make a contribution. By the way, not all, that's absolutely fine. There needs to be um, all kinds of different research uh, and, and focusing on many societal challenges. Um, a pull, if you like, a demand from policymakers, practitioners, um, clinicians, public servants, and others who actually would like to um, make sure that their decisions are informed by research and evidence where possible. 
Um, and then you've got, and this is incredibly simplistic, um, but then you've got some facilitating funders and facilitating structures which are hopefully coming in to help support that and make sure that that sort of knowledge is gathered and that that translation happens and that decisions can be informed. So that's my sort of uh, very rough ideal type of, of what might be happening um, as, we, as we move through this, this period. Um, one of the, I'll focus now just for a minute on one of the particular uh, mechanisms, if you like, which is um, becoming, I think, in, in some ways increasingly interesting and, and helpful in this, um, is, uh, and I believe that Patrick Valens mentioned this last week in, in his lecture, um, the areas of research interest. Now, these are uh, documents, some of them more sophisticated than others, it has to be said, some of them not quite published yet, but um, nearly all government departments have now published their areas of research interest, uh, which are setting out the areas that they think are the most, uh, the areas they most need help with, if you like, the questions they've got that have not been answered that they think the research community could potentially help with. And it's become a, a way of hopefully organizing those researchers who have uh, research knowledge and expertise and methods that they could bring to bear but aren't quite sure how to dock into it um, with, with policymakers and practitioners who have those questions. Now, um, a certain number of those uh, areas of research interest, the, the questions that have been articulated, if you, do, if you look through all of them and count up all of the questions, um, which we have uh, because we're like that, um, but if you, if you do that, you come up with a certain number of questions which are actually um, specifically, say, social science questions. Uh, and so um, just to wake people up in the room, if you feel like it, um, if you'd like to have a go at thinking about across all the government departments who have published their areas of research interest, including transport, Ministry of Defense, Justice, DWP, all of them, um, anyone want to have a go at what proportion are actually social science questions? No? Shall I show you? So, yeah, so 63% of the questions that have been articulated in those, at least by some reckoning, um, are social science questions, pretty much first and foremost. Then perhaps another 15% or so are questions that probably start from other disciplines, but that end up needing social science if you're really going to answer them. So um, that's how that um, plays out because it's all kinds of questions about how do we get people back into work? How do we reduce long-term unemployment? How do we uh, help people stay in their homes for longer, healthily? How do, we, uh, how do people move around cities? And, and what would be the best way to organize transport so that it works for people? How, you know, so the, the, how do people use energy in workplaces and in their homes? And what can we do to, to reduce energy consumption? So these are questions about people, about behavior, about relationships, about how we interact with each other. Now, of course, um, many of those topics are, are, seem like fundamental areas of social science with which you'll all be familiar, especially if you've been working um, on any of those, uh, for government departments on any of those areas, or in your own empirical work if you are doing that. Um, this now, we have the industrial strategy, which is uh, driving a, a, some of the new funding, quite a lot of the, the new cross-cutting funds, shall we say. Um, and these are the kind of the pillars, if you like, some of the pillars of the industrial strategy. And those also look like pretty familiar terrain, I think, for, for social scientists and people who are used to thinking about people and what, what all of this means. Um, but they're, they're actually um, being pursued uh, uh, often along lines which, which may not be starting from social science. So, um, in fact, they're, they're actually thinking about uh, the technology that will be needed in order to achieve some of these, or the AI and data economy one is actually primarily at the moment focusing on, on health and early diagnosis. These are all incredibly important areas, and I, I'm not in any way uh, suggesting they're not. But I suppose the question then is also, uh, in addition to all these other disciplines and, and focal points um, for, for these areas, how can those of you who are social scientists or who are working with social scientists, how can we think about what social science can bring to bear? Um, and again, that's not to say that social science has to only focus on these things, but for those who want to try to dock into the new funding, who want to think about how they can work in interdisciplinary ways in, in some of this new landscape, um, how might they uh, do so? 
And I suppose I've, you know, just a few of the kind of many, many possible areas uh, that we could consider would be things like who's actually producing the knowledge uh, for, uh, say, um, the data economy, who's, who's writing the al algorithms, for example. Um, what's the knowledge about, or what are these tools about? Who, who, what are they focusing on? And what are the kinds of diverse needs and challenges of different people, uh, different sectors, different kinds of communities? So, um, and then finally, I, I, as I put here, although there, as I said, there are many more, critically reflecting on what are likely to be some of the different consequences for different um, groups and communities and individuals of these different kinds of technological advances. So as you think about some of the things that have been discussed in this series already about trust in experts, about what the public wants from research, about how it will affect them, um, it seems to me that some of these questions really putting people in this frame of uh, thinking about the frontiers of science which UKRI and our research funding can, can advance um, is, is quite a useful thing to do. So those, those are just a few of the kinds of uh, you know, almost larger questions that you could be thinking about when thinking about some of these advances. Um, I also want to think a little bit about uh, some more specific questions and how bringing a new kind of framing or a kind of a wider social science lens might actually change some of what otherwise sometimes end up being very, very specific uh, sets of proximate answers to, to very narrow questions. Um, and sometimes that's perfectly helpful and legitimate. Uh, but actually sometimes we can do more. So here's one which is obviously relevant in w when we're thinking about population aging and reduced mobility can happen at any point in the life course, of course, for different people, but in an aging uh, society, we do need to think about it. Uh, we still need people to be able to get to the shops and schools and work and so on. And uh, if we ask this question in a very narrow frame and with this very tight lens, um, we might say, great, okay, well, if we want that, uh, we may need to, to use mobility scooters, for example, as one way to get people from place to place without increasing congestion, without uh, actually stopping them uh, getting to where they need to go. Um, that's, that's great, that, that will do the trick for some people and in some instances, um, but actually, if we ask the, the broader frame and say, you know, how can we compensate for reduced mobility, uh, maybe we want to um, think about uh, other factors that might also be important, the wider societal context. Uh, and then we can sort of broaden out that lens a little bit, and, and there's all kinds of other things that then come into play. Uh, and I think there are, you know, very deep areas of expertise, some of which in the room, uh, across a whole range of these things that are uh, now up on the screen. Um, and, and that's great because it, it, it broadens the lens, it lets us think about not just the proximate answer to a proximate question, but um, how might we, we avoid uh, growing disability or, or, or reduce mobility in the first place? How can we therefore better maintain mobility? Um, or, taking a broader view even, how can we make sure that we have environments that are actually more accessible, whether workplaces, uh, city centers, and so on, so that people can continue to convene and shop and see each other and live in a social world. So, um, uh, it really, it seems to me that, that uh, that's quite a useful thing to do because then a mobility scooter is part of the answer for some uh, examples, but actually there's all kinds of other things and this is only a very tiny list of the many that one might then come up with um, having broadened the lens. So I think it seems to me that there are lots of areas in which social science might come to bear on a range of the kind of scientific, technological and health challenges that we're um, in any case thinking about at the moment. And um, one of the ones that I think it's also useful to, to just raise as an example, and, and, and many people will be familiar with it as an example, but it actually sort of looks from the other end of the telescope, if you like, and starts from questions about um, if we're funding deep knowledge and uh, you know, very uh, significant disciplinary expertise in its own right and thinking about people who are thinking about uh, communities and lifestyles and practices, not because they're trying to answer a particular question, but because they're just trying to learn about people and the world around them, um, then we might take a different example. And, and that's the Ebola outbreak. And that was, you know, of course, a very uh, significant crisis of uh, health and uh, medicine was needed and public health experts were needed. Um, but actually, one of the keys to uh, reducing the spread of the disease, it turned out, was uh, anthropologists who understood 
the, the community practices and indeed specifically burial practices that were contributing to the spread and who had the knowledge of those communities and the trust of those communities to be able to find ways of sensitively changing those practices so that uh, they would be able to go in and help the public health experts and the medics to, to actually um, come up with other ways of, as I said, sensitive, sensitively um, engaging with those communities and stopping the spread of the disease, um, at least reducing it quite significantly. So um, something that wasn't set up to be a kind of a quick answer to a quick problem uh, came to bear in very important ways. So finally, um, just to, to look very briefly at um, the kind of recent, the last um, decade or two, and we can see that most of what has been produced in the world, and uh, what we currently at least see and define as goods and services, and much of the data, or most of the data uh, in the world has actually um, been produced and, and, uh, and appeared in the last sort of couple of decades. Now, um, that's really important. We live in a time of, of uh, ever-increasing data and information, and it raises questions um, not only for uh, technology and how we process it all and what we can do with it all and the brilliant ways that it, we can improve health with it all, but also what it, it, how it affects people and human behavior. So one of the things that, that I think it's uh, useful to, to think about as an example is um, you know, what happens when we have fairly constant and, and significant biometric feedback about all the things that are going on in our bodies. Um, we already have lots of wearable tech. It's showing more and more, uh, it's able to tell us more and more about what's happening and what happens when we know that our stress levels are up or our cholesterol is up or our insulin is down or, and, and that there's something that we need to therefore do and manage about our own bodies. Um, we haven't really evolved to do that. That's we've, we've trusted experts to, to tell us what needed to happen with our health and well-being often. Um, but increasingly, as we know what's going on in our bodies, we may be expected to manage that ourselves and to do, uh, whether it's medical procedures, injecting ourselves with, with insulin, um, as is already happening in some cases, um, or other things in order to manage that. Um, well, it's interesting to think about the kind of the psychological resilience that might be needed for that. It's quite a significant extra cognitive load to be thinking all the time about what's going on in our bodies and what we need to do about it while we're also trying to work, while we're also trying to read and think and get to work and so on. Um, it it's also um, it requires many of the changes that we would need to undertake in order to manage and improve our health when we find out about something that's going on um, also require time. They also require, so they require time resources, they require financial resources, some of them. They require um, contextual resources, like to eat better. We might, you know, we might be living in an area where it's very difficult to, to easily find healthy food, or we might be working such long hours or looking after so many people that it's hard to afford or be able to prepare um, healthier food. So, so there will be differential access, if you like, to coping with all of this information and to doing what might need to be done about it. Of course, if we think about uh, insurance companies then having that information potentially in the future and insurance premiums going up and down depending on how we manage that, um, that would amplify that yet even further. So there's lots of potential for things that are going on currently or being developed currently to have very significant implications uh, for people, for their resources, for their outcomes. And it seems to me that this is something where uh, we might really want to think about the role of social sciences, not just in reflecting on what's going on, not just in looking back in a few years' time and saying this is what happened, um, or, or, or tr even trying to model what might happen, but to actually think here are some of the risks and here are some of the opportunities, here's how we might want to try and mitigate some of those if it might have these distributional impacts. Um, and, and so really trying to get to grips with the role of social science in those advancing frontiers of science, if you like. So, um, I, I've said quite a lot about some of the changes that it seems to me are relevant for the current uh, funding landscape and thinking about the role of social science in it, just a, a very quick trot through that. Um, 
I, I would like to emphasize that, uh, of course, we need to continue to fund and uh, undertake um, world-leading social science within the disciplines, investigator-led, the innovative thinking uh, that you all do uh, when you come up with the ideas based on your deep expertise over long periods of study. Um, that's absolutely crucial because we can't just suddenly uh, draw disciplines together where there isn't the, the depth and richness already um, there to, to build on. So that's, that's kind of first and foremost. Let's make sure that that's still happening. Um, but let's also, of course, uh, maintain and even extend the data infrastructure that supports many of these disciplines, if not all, um, but, but certainly lots of them depend on a really strong data infrastructure to be able to um, do analyses and, and understand what's going on or raise the questions that then need deeper um, other kinds of research to go on as well. Let's also, uh, in my view, make sure that we sustain and evolve the kinds of training that, and, and early, re early career work that ensures that we have both diversity and depth of expertise um, for, for the research leadership of the future. And I think we're, we're, well, I know that we're doing some quite serious thinking in the ESRC now about what that means. What will research leadership mean in the future? It, it probably doesn't mean running a, a department in a, in a faculty, although that is also an important kind of leadership. Um, there will be something about uh, interdisciplinarity and about growing and, and sustaining teams, which will be very important. And um, we need to build further capability then to work across disciplines, to fund across disciplines, to peer review across disciplines, and so forth, but also across fields, sectors, and boundaries. So that's across uh, councils, across other kinds of funding bodies, and across uh, other kinds of uh, government and, and non-governmental bodies, so that we really can address some of these societal challenges that already exist or that are coming down the track. And finally, supporting research that will elucidate how these frontiers of science are going to be shaped and who's shaping them and what are some of the implications of this. And then for those of you who don't like making recommendations, at least talk about the implications and, and whether there's anything that, that we know from, from research might actually um, help mitigate some of that. So I think that's all I want to say for now, um, but thank you very much for, for having me here tonight to talk about some of that, and I look forward very much to hearing your thoughts on, uh, well, everything really from um, some of the things I've said to some of your own experiences, um, thoughts, and concerns about the role of social science, whether you are a social scientist, whether you're a consumer of social science, or whether you work with social scientists yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much for an amazing sort of overview of how it all started and um, <laughs> hopefully where it might be going. Um, as Jennifer said at the beginning, she um, is very particularly, uh, she'd like to have a, a discussion and, and although, you know, obviously everyone is willing to ask a question, please, you know, if, if you are a younger researcher and, and this is your opportunity um, to talk to the Chief Executive of the ESRC. Um, but I have to remind you that this is all being videoed, um, and as I say, oh, yeah, every, every week, um, if, if you don't want to be videoed, then um, please don't um, ask a question because we can't edit you out. We have um, a microphone at the back, and so please um, just put your hand up and, and we will um, start the discussion. Uh, we're going to go there and then to the front. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so as an economist who studies innovation, I'm very interested in a lot of the social science questions that you kind of proposed and um, especially around, you know, distribu distributional impacts of uh, innovation and how we think about steering the direction of innovation. Um, one of the challenges that I face consistently is um, actually one of the last points that you hit and that's in getting the data to actually study these questions. And so this is either um, through policymakers and governments or, uh, and there's been a lot of efforts actually uh, here in the UK to make that a little bit more possible, but either through policy um, and governments or working with businesses. And then on top of that, not just getting access to the data, but potentially running some experiments with them so that we can really get to the, the nitty gritty of what's going on here um, with the questions that you're posing. So I was wondering if you have any tips or thoughts on how we might do that better, um, or also talk about any efforts that might already be happening in that space. Great. Um, yes, I don't need the microphone, do I? Okay, is that working? Um, so really good question, and uh, yeah, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, 
the ESRC is, has launched recently a, a major new initiative, which is in some ways launching, in some ways rebooting, um, but, but really focusing on uh, the use of admin data and of linking admin data from across you know, all, all the different departments and, and uh, places that people come into contact with government systems and, and public offices and so on, uh, so that we can get the, the best possible population-based you know, data that we can, anonymized, of course, you know, just uh, understanding what's going on and linking so that we can see uh, what's happening in, in, in education, how it might uh, anonymously link data might, might show us what's happening between education and justice or between education, justice and welfare and so on. So, so um, the, you know, in, in my view, this is kind of the CERN for social science. If we can do this well, if we can really get all this data together and, and start getting it anonymously linked and, and really start to understand what the trajectories of contact with services and, and of outcomes are, um, that allows us not only to, uh, to much more rapidly, although nothing about getting access to data at the moment feels rapid, so I, I use that with caution, but much more, uh, you know, when it's going, to much more rapidly um, access information about what's going on, and also to look at what's happening, what changes when different policies change and so on, so, so uh, and potentially to, to use that data to also inform about experimentation. So um, uh, I'm very pleased and, and excited to hear that you know, you're, you're keen for, for that to happen. I'm, I'm really delighted that ESRC is, is making this a major investment and a, and a focus, and, and I hope that you'll benefit from that very soon. And, and I, mean, I think all social scientists see that as, as probably one of the major problems we've had in this country, yes. that, that quite often you go to other countries because they can link admin data into yes. surveys, etc. So that, I think that's a wonderful step. Yeah. And yes. we want to keep you here doing this. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on how we approach the challenge of a cross-discipline peer review. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, that's an excellent question. It's one that is a live question now. I, I don't think I can give you the answer, but I'd be really interested to hear if you have particular thoughts at the moment. It's, it's something that's uh, opening up as a discussion, of course, across UKRI and really thinking about um, we, if we want to fund into this space, if we want to do brilliant research in this space, we really need to think, you know, what's the best way to do that? So um, thoughts, very welcome. I think that this is something that we'll need to feed into over the coming period. And then Bernard. Thank you very much for, also for the historical overview you gave. Uh, for someone who came to the UK two years ago, uh, as a social scientist, uh, more uh, familiar with the continental um, European situation, uh, I was struck on the one hand that you know, there is a division of research councils in, in the UK. I mean, in uh, uh, Germany, where spent uh, ten, 10 years uh, doing research. Uh, the German Research Foundation uh, uh, basically uh, covers all uh, disciplines mm -hmm. and the social sciences are doing relatively well in getting a, a, uh, a good share uh, of research funding, but much better than the NS in the NSF in the American mm -hmm. uh, case. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, interesting and striking that it took such a long time um, mm -hmm. uh, for the UK and that social sciences uh, written large, including economics, um, has been excluded away uh, from that kind of uh, research funding. My question is, uh, could you reflect a bit about, uh, because uh, the other observation that I have is that in the UK, research funding is so much more driven, on the one hand, on the impact story that you need to prove, uh, basically already before you start, uh, at least uh, uh, suggest uh, a kind of an impact. On the other hand, also that it's often funding top down more than bottom up. Uh, so if I would translate that in, in the European context, it's much more about Horizon 2020, the challenges that you laid out, uh, predefined uh, by uh, politicians and, and scientists. Mm -hmm. These are the things we want to fund versus the ERC, the, the uh, European Research Council, where it's the initiatives of, and the self-definition mm -hmm. of the sciences, uh, the researchers. This is the leading topic. This is the frontiers of science. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, could you say something about you know, balancing the two sides? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, it's a really good question, but I, I actually think, I mean, for, to, to my mind, 
um, the, the kind of what you're calling top-down or challenge-led, I guess I, I was describing it as um, funding, much of that really is coming through the, the new kind of UK research and in, innovation kind of structure. Um, and, and that, uh, I think, you know, on, in the wake of the nurse review, was that, that was actually what it was setting out to do, was to make sure that, that disciplines worked together and really tackled the major um, societal challenges of our time. Now, who determines what those societal challenges are? That's, a, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I, I think that it's important for researchers to, to help in that formation and that, uh, that framing. Um, but I don't think anyone's suggesting that we won't be doing the kind of responsive, investigator-led, uh, blue skies research that, that I think you're talking about um, in terms of the ERC. I think, that, as I've said, you know, I think that's so important that we have the healthy disciplines, the investigator-led research that's really helping, as you say, innovate and take forward those frontiers of whether it's social science or, 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 or science or technology or medicine. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't for a minute suggest that, that the one will swamp or, 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 or take away from the other. In fact, I mean, arguably, the fact that we have UKRI and the new challenge-led funds ought to give us uh, some freedom to really think about, so, so what does the core, I mean, no one's taking away at the moment, <laughs> as far as I've been told, um, ESRC's core delegation, if you like. And so uh, we're, you know, there are very live discussions about what that should focus on, given that there is also the, in, 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 you know, the, the challenge-led funding. I think that's really important questions. I actually think uh, uh, something which you kind of alluded to but didn't, didn't actually ask is about, um, those big cross-cutting funds, uh, and, and they're often about you know the science and technology. It, it's also about where that brilliant um, social science can dock into to those things and make sure that it's it's it is about a mixture of disciplines and and not just interdisciplinary, but actually uh, really looking across the piece. So. Um, I, I was very interested in um, when you were talking about going forward and you talked about training mm -hmm. uh, and this idea about research leadership and mm -hmm. moving to some element of, of teams rather than just departments and that research leadership um, because, and it goes back to Ella's question, that, that in a way we live in a world where multidisciplinary research is absolutely essential, mm -hmm. but when, particularly through the REF I'm afraid, when we come mm -hmm. to actually um, testing the academic excellence of it, we still look primarily at disciplinary journals, uh, and we tend to have disciplinary review. Um, and presumably, if, if we are going to shift to a more sort of team, multidisciplinary-based leadership, that, in theory, would provide a structure which would have a tremendous impact in changing it. But is that really going to be possible within the kind of very much departmental and disciplinary-based mm -hmm. research environment that actually we have still in our universities? Um, I mean, that's a, a fantastic and very difficult question, uh, which I think partly depends on the leadership in, in the universities as well, but also on, on what journals it's possible to publish in, on uh, what demand there is to, to do that research. So, I mean, th there, there needs to be a movement from all of those different mm -hmm. uh, uh, people and incentives and so on. Um, I, I think it's I think it's worth a shot myself because I think mm -hmm. I think that actually if we could it's, it's, it, again as I say it's it's not about everybody moving into that space but if we want to really address some of these challenges and really do interdisciplinarity uh, we we will need uh, potentially some new journals or journals to shift some of their focus we will need uh, university departments and and uh, institutions to recognise that you know interdisciplinary research is a thing and and you don't you, you're not necessarily just just going to be in a department of sociology or just mm -hmm. in a, you know, and, and um, I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to that as someone who had to choose early on when I got offers to be in a, a department of sociology or a department of uh, uh, sociology and politics or psychology. And it was sort of, well, actually, I kind of need some of all of those to answer these questions. And so, ha you know, how do you do that? And I'm, I'm kind of, I'm both heartened and disappointed that that it's a very live discussion now, but that actually, you know, we haven't made perhaps quite as much progress as, as uh, I might have hoped in the kind of 25 years since, since I was thinking about it. Um, I think that there are more interdisciplinary, uh, certainly institutes, and, and I think that, that their work is, is very well recognized. Um, and that's fantastic, and that is different. And there are more policy institutes, and there are more, uh, more ways of being a researcher, I suppose, in some ways. 
but that's not the same as having had a fundamental shift in the kind of the peer review and the journal landscape and, and the uh, departmental landscape. So um, I think that's something that we will have to watch and try to help shape uh, in, in the coming years. So. I think that that's really important. I mean, as, as someone who worked in demography, I, I've worked in history, geography, mm -hmm. public policy, yeah. and sociology. Um, and each time one was sort of encouraged by one's head of department when you were younger to publish in those yeah, journals. So if you look at my publication record, it's very strange. Mm -hmm. um, but presumably what you're talking about actually needs resources and money yep. um, in order. But, um, Absolutely. And outlets. And outlets, yes. yes. Um, Charles. Sorry, Hannah. Uh, I very much enjoyed your talk, and uh, I, I take your uh, challenge for universities that we have to be more agile about doing interdisciplinary research, but can I push you a little bit on where you okay. care I can really make a difference, yeah. and that is in the REF, and I think that UK research across the board has been much better because of 20 years of REF, but, uh, an RAE, but uh, I do wonder whether the, so universities very much respond to the incentives that are embodied in the R in REF and the, uh, and the RAE. And I do wonder whether it is a time to have a look at that, uh, both in terms of the, uh, the one, the, the sort of four paper model for each investigator, which I think acts against interdisciplinary research and acts against collaborative research. And again, I think the, um, the impact uh, a side of it again is is really good but again the way it's implemented in a fairly algorithmic way designed to be resistant to judicial challenge mm. whether there is some challenge there for you UKRI to get that better knowing again that whatever you do will be reversed engineered by the academic community <laughs> yeah great um, yes I, I often hear it said that uh, although uh, economics has increasingly come to the realization that, that people are not rational actors. Uh, universities and academics uh, are actually <laughs> some of the people who respond best to incentives uh, of, all the, of all the professions and, and uh, potential rational actors out there. Um, and, and I absolutely think we need to think very carefully about, about you know, what, what uh, incentives are, are being set up and, and whether and how we can, we can tweak those. Um, I'm, I'm not going to make a public statement of policy on YouTube right now, but I'm very happy to discuss and hear your thoughts on how we can, we can help think that through and make it easier to do this kind of uh, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and um, moving across boundaries. So, yeah, thanks. And I think we have a couple of questions at the back. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Really good talk. Um, you started off by saying one of the reasons you ended up here was that you were frustrated with this disconnect between the great research you'd seen and then the government policies that were actually being enacted. Do you feel like that's improved? Because <laughs> the impression I get is that not, there's still a huge disconnect, things mm. like drugs, welfare, schools. Um, is there any hope for that to, to improve? Like, yeah. Do you think that these challenges might have an effect? Or um, I, yeah, is that part of your scope to try and get policymakers, um, like the actual government ministers, to listen more? Um, really good question, and yes, uh, I, I think the answer is, is basically yes. I think, it, I think it's already moved in lots of areas. Uh, some areas are more difficult than others, let's face it. They are more politicized, they are more challenging. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, the research and, and people's views are, are, are just too divergent at a particular time. Um, and I, I'm not going to pretend that it's, it's easy or it's going to about to become easy. Um, but having said that, with uh, lots of the new mechanisms that have come into place, and, and I think, you know, I, 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 I will go on about it a little bit. I think the publication of these areas of research interest is not a small thing, by the way. Uh, it, it really is government department saying, it, it, it wasn't easy either, by the way, I know a bit of the inside story. It wasn't just that someone said, oh, you know, well, if you put your areas of research interest out there, then, then uh, researchers will respond to them. Um, first of all, we all know that it's not that easy because research takes time to set up and get funded and all of that. Um, but from the other side, it wasn't just that everybody just said, oh, yeah, here they are. Um, some had to think more carefully than others about what they were. And some really weren't sure they wanted to actually just say, oh, there's a lot of stuff we don't know the answer to. 
right? But, um, you know, I, in an interesting sort of way, you might think um, being able to ask for help is the first sign of the ro road to recovery or whatever, if you wanted to think of it as a kind of a, a problem that we're trying to address. It, it's the admission that there are these, you know, big gaps in our knowledge, which, of course, is at one level no surprise. How could there not be big gaps in our knowledge? Uh, and especially in, in the knowledge of departments who are running very fast. I mean, I know a lot of people working uh, in government who are, I mean, apart from the fact that there's a lot of things that they have to work on at the moment that are over and above uh, their normal day jobs, but um, there are a lot of people working in government who really care to do the right thing. But actually, I wouldn't underestimate how difficult it is either, um, not just because of, you know, whether, whether, you know, things fit or not with a, a particular political agenda or policy agenda, but actually, um, in, in fact, you know, policymakers can't access journals, uh, and even if they could, they don't have a lot of time to sit and do lots of reading, or even know what the terminology is they might need to search for often. So, so saying, here are some things that we're wondering about in kind of everyday language, and having researchers start to think about, oh, these are, these are some really big pressing questions that we could probably help with, and, and sending, sending them your papers, sending them a summary, a research brief, um, coming to, you know, we will be doing uh, some roundtables and workshops around some of them, and some universities have already started doing that. So, so I, I, I absolutely, look, I'm an optimist, or I, you know, I wouldn't have done all the different things that I've done uh, if I weren't hopeful, but I, I really do think that there's an opportunity for us to help shape that and for research to, to really uh, do more in that respect. And then we have the last question at the back. Yep. Hi, yeah. Um, I was wondering, so I'm going to soon be entering the world of social science. Um, and I've gotten some interesting feedback about how we should be focusing more on having like a data analysis background, AI background, that we shouldn't be focusing on specific domains, that we should try and have a, as well-rounded of a base of knowledge as possible. I was just curious to hear from you what you saw as some of the sort of ideal um, skills and characteristics of sort of future social scientists. Really good question. Um, Okay, I'll have a go at that, but I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be saying this is what you should be as a social scientist, because actually, you know, I think you guys in the room are, are social science of the future, and I'm also interested to hear what, you, you know, what would facilitate that for you and what kind of training you feel you need. Um, but I, I am willing to say that uh, it seems to me that whether you are uh, an anthropologist or a sociologist or a demographer who in integrates lots of different things or um, an economist, uh, or, or whether you are see yourself as a qualitative researcher or a quantitative researcher or you know whatever it would be, um, I do think that understanding uh, the, a, a really deep uh, understanding of what it would take to answer the questions or the issues you're trying to address is is very worth having. So not just it's not the individual methods per se that I'm talking about now, although there are obviously you, you do need training in methods, but but really being able to think about what methods and approaches are appropriate given what you are wondering about, thinking about, researching, uh, and, and being able to situate whatever methods or, or, or approaches you do then take in that kind of wider landscape of, of what's possible. Um, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's worth saying because I think it helps us get away from kind of quantitative, qualitative splits and, and so on and thinking about, well, these are the questions uh, if I if I look at this uh, you know big data set, it's going to give me a kind of a picture of what's going on. I might need to work with some anthropologists to then understand some of why that's going on. I might need to work with an economist who can do some regressions to tell us you know w w what happened with you know what that that break in the data is. So so just to really think about the role of the different different areas, and that doesn't mean you have to become an expert in all of them, but. I think in order to be those kind of researchers of the future that will be able to integrate some of that knowledge and will be able to answer some of these questions, knowing wh who you might need to work with and what kinds of questions they can help you answer is, is a, a very worthwhile skill. Um, I think sadly we must stop there. Thank you, Jennifer, so much. Um, thank you all for coming. Remember that all these videos are, um, the entire set are now, or well, will be any minute now, uh, up on YouTube. And as I have said before, we, we are gathering all of this together to put it into um, a book which will reflect the different perspectives. Um, but it was wonderful to have you with us, and thank you very much for your very frank discussion. Please come up and see Jennifer afterwards if you've got some private questions, but can we thank her uh, for an excellent overview this evening? Thank you.